today we will be going on a virtual field trip with Miss Thompson. We will be looking at the Fort Walton Indian Burial Mound in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. So where is Fort Walton Beach? So you'll see here that I took the starting point as the Cleveland Board of Education and I mapped it all the way down to where the Temple Museum is. So you've got Cleveland up here, this long drive down here, and I tell you it is a very long drive. And then as you get, um, so you'll see the water that is down here, the water that, why is this not moving? This water right here, is the Gulf of Mexico. And this is the border of Florida. And this part of Florida is called the Panhandle. So as I get zoomed in, oops, you've got the Gulf of Mexico right here. And this is that Panhandle of Florida. And the temple that you're going to be seeing for your virtual field trip is right here. So it's right here on the water. Um, so that is where we are for today's field trip. The City of Fort Walton Beach Heritage Park and Cultural Center is where the Indian Temple Mound Museum is located. That's in the City of Fort Walton Beach, Florida. We're going to be looking at the museum and the mound itself. So first we're going to see the museum. And in the museum it's full of artifacts from over 14,000 years of Native American occupation around this area. It has over 10,000 artifacts of stone, bone, shell, and clay from a 40-mile radius around downtown Fort Walton Beach. Now, here's what we need to understand. That we think, normally when we think of Native Americans, we think of the names of the tribes that we learned from the Europeans that landed here. But these people in this museum are from an earlier time period before those. These are the, the ancestors of those tribes that we know, and they come from five specific periods, Paleolithic, Archaic, Transitional, Woodland, and Mississippi, Mississippian. Let's go see the museum. When, when you first, first enter the museum, museum you see, see the sign. It talks about the, talks people about the early peoples that first lived Florida's in this waterway and they had 12,000 years ago. They do not know their names. Um, but they do know that the different time periods in which they were, and we're talking the um, Paleolithic period right here. So um, then you're going to see how they found their items. They found items of art, which were their pottery and their jewelry and different things like that. So in the Paleolithic period, you have a lot of stone um, objects that are being used. The Paleolithic period was 13,000 BC to 8,000 BC. So this was a really, really long time ago. And you see there's arrowheads, there's different um, stones and different things that they used as tools to get their food, to protect themselves, and basically to protect themselves from a lot of these animals that worked their way down through North America. So the Archaic period is the next time period, and that's 8,000 B.C. to 1,000 B.C. These Native Americans were hunter-gatherers, and they left um, artifacts from all over um, that they used for hunting and shell mounds along the creeks and the bays of the area. And you'll see some of their pottery there and the things they used. And they actually also were 
starting fires to cook and things like that. So here's some more examples of their pottery and their different stone craft. There's different meanings of the colors um, uh, with their, their pottery and the colors they use to decorate different items. And then you learned a little bit about the importance of art to these people. And you see these beautiful necklaces that they made and they all told a story. They all meant something. It wasn't just, oh, this is a pretty design. They literally created um, these artifacts, which were things they used at the time to just tell a story. It's kind of like a history book right there in, in um, stone. So the next period is the woodland period. That's 1000 BC to 1000 AD. And this time of change introduced fiber tempered pottery, which would become a hallmark of the woodland period. And these are the first ceramics in Northwest uh, Florida from this period. And you see that the, their tools and their weapons are far more advanced. They are made with materials that keep them going good. This is where they created this way to start fire. And you see in this video that the person is starting a fire because they did not have matches. They did not have lighters. This is how they started fire. And I just took a quick video of that because we could have sat there and watched forever. And a woodland period burial mound in Fort Walton Beach occurs during this time. Not the one we're looking at here, but it, they would use different things for burial. And there's an example of a dog that was buried with someone and you see their pottery and how it has different colors and really weird shapes. And they all meant something. They were all for a specific use. This is also when they started to weave baskets. So they would use different materials to make baskets, to make rope, to make um, nets for fishing. The next period is the Mississippian period. That's 1000 AD to the European contact around 1500 AD. So this is the materials that they had. Um, they built, this group of people built the Temple Mound and the village around it that you're going to be seeing as we leave the um, museum and we go outside. So this is the final prehistoric culture, which means the first, the last culture that didn't have things written down about them. We've only learned about them through the artifacts that have been found. And they used um, the skin of animals that for different purposes, they had symbols that represented specific things. It was kind of like their language in which they could share their stories. And keep in mind, stories are gonna play an important role here with these prehistoric Native Americans. And then these are just some examples of pottery. There's my feet and arrows that are from all the time periods that we have been talking about. These were some of the ships that they had and the ships that came with the European exploration in Florida. People came to Florida from Europe because they wanted to find gold and wealth and, and the secret of long life. And here is a timeline of that European exploration. And one of the last exhibits here is of a uh, seminal canoe. 
So if you're a sports person and you watch sports, there is the Florida State Seminoles. It is one of the Native American tribes that were in Florida. And there is a lovely picture of me with my mask on, my Cleveland Browns mask on, uh, at the museum. Here is an example of a piece of art that was made about this time period and different artifacts. Native Americans used herbs medicinally and here's a whole bunch of arrowheads and different things that they used for weapons. It's important to understand because the past is our common ancestry. Here is a human effigy vessel. So it was something that was made to um, represent people. Here's what I like. They were story keepers. They were word keepers. They were myth makers. Storytelling was a very important art with this last group, the Mississippian period. They All of their stories meant something. Um, and this whole village would come together and tell stories. There were stories about the summer. There were stories about the winter. Um, and you only told those stories in the specific time period. Um, you had to be very succinct and make sure that the information you were relaying was accurate because if not, it could anger the spirit world world in their eyes and it could be very, very bad for them. And so these stories are how their history was told and how we learned about their history. So here's one about how the bear lost his tail and that's from the Choctaw um, tribe. And so the story would represent something. So a very long time ago, Bear had a beautiful flowing long tail of which he was very proud. But Bear also had a very strong smell. The strong smell was a problem for all the bears because human hunters were able to find them when the blue, wind blew their strong scent on the breeze. So Bear went to the wind to complain. And so you see this here. It was about a way to protect himself. This one is the buzzard and the wren rescue the sun. And they believed that the sun was an important part of life and they worshiped the sun and they also wanted to make sure because sun is what helped them grow their crops. It helped them to survive. And so there were a lot of stories focused on the sun and on animals that could go up into the sky and help. A buzzard is typically thought of to be an animal that eats bad things. Then there's the one about why rattlesnakes can bite. That's also a Choctaw. Um, and it talks about how this uh, rattlesnake spent all of her time and energy preparing a home for her new baby. And it, th there's a, like a moral to each story. And this was a way for them to explain why animals and things did what they did. But it was also warnings for people on how to behave. This one is the rabbit steals fire. Okay. And when there was no fire, um, they didn't know how to get fire. They know they needed fire. They would see fire when lightning struck and started things on fire. But they needed to come um, and learn about fire. And so this goes through a whole story about how rabbit... Um, reached across to the far side of the ocean and he met the people who had fire and he brought fire. This one is why possum's tail is bare. And this is Cherokee. Um, and they say possums used to have a long and bushy tail. 
um, and he combed it and took care of it every day. And Rabbit, who had no tail at all since Bear pulled it out, was very jealous and made up his mind to play a trick on the possum. And so, again, you have a bunch of animals here that are talking and acting in ways that humans act and doing different things. Okay, so now we're going to leave the museum and we're going to head outside. And this is the story of the Fort Walton Temple Mound. Okay, so you would have seen, you see the village right there. There's a, a statue next to it. And the temple would have been the center, and all around it would have been the village with the people. The only thing that remains today is the temple. And this is the mound. This is one side of the mound. When you're looking, it just kind of looks like a hill. It doesn't look like anything special. There's palm trees and different types of trees and all, you know, different types of plants. And there's the museum. And then it was interesting that there was a story about the red buckeye, you know, Ohio buckeyes. And the buckeye was actually used for fishing because they would take part of the, um, the nut and they would use it to stun the fish and then catch the fish. So here is the mound as we are starting to climb the stairs up the mound and Actually, we're now at the top. Yes, we are at the top of the mound now. And it was talking about preserving, this sign is talking about preserving and protecting the mound and what people have done to preserve this history. And I'm telling you, the mound is literally in the middle of the city. This is the temple. We could not go in there. There's nothing in there, but we could not go in there. We're fenced off. And so I have just this video and you see on the other side of the mound, you can see that there's cars and there's stores and there's all kinds of things. But there's a lot of very big and old and majestic trees all around. You see the stores and the cars going by, it's right off of a major um, street, uh, like Euclid Avenue, very busy street. And see how the top of the mound is just kind of flat. So the mound would be there and the people would be, and there's my dad who went to the temple mound with me. And you would see everything come up to it and then it flattened out. And then that's what this is, is talking about, the story of the Fort Walton Temple Mound. Okay, so it was a part of the Mississippi period between 800 AD and 1400 AD. They built this mound so a building on its summit could be the residence of the leader, a temple for religious ceremonies, and a place to direct games and public activities. Leaders were also buried in this mound. And so now we've come back down and there's my dad again. And did not get the concept of staying out of my video as I was trying to take it. Um, but this is the side. We're now walking back towards the street. So we've been on one side of the mound, one side of the square, even though it's really not a square. But you're looking at it that way. And we're heading towards the major street. We were also practicing a lot of social distancing. So sometimes you'll see a little pause because I needed to wait until the group that was ahead of us um, moved on because of social distancing. And I tried not to get them in our video. So here we are down on street level looking at the side of the mound. And it just, you know, it just looks like trees. This is the front side that's on the Miracle Strip. That's the name of the, of the street. You see the sign for the mound. 
and then just walking along looking at all the different types of palm trees. I didn't realize there were so many different types of palm trees. I'm a girl from Ohio. We don't have palm trees. So I did learn a lot about a bunch of different types of palm trees. Again, this is one of the places I had to pause waiting for the other group to move ahead of us. So right here is like, it's a, it's a historic national landmark. And places have to go through a lot of work in order to get national landmark status. And so you guys can read that. It was in 1965. And then these are the front stairs that would take you up to the mound, but it's closed because a lot of the items in the museum, er, that whole area are closed. That's called a navy tree. And then lastly, what I have here is a cannon because Fort Walton um, used to be an establishment um, for the military. So it was originally called Camp Walton. It was a Confederate installation. So that was during the Civil War. Um, it was constructed in 1861 to guard the East Pass. So if you think back to when I showed you that video, that video of the map, it showed that it was right there on the water. Right there at that area is a place where people can come in. There is like land, then a little strip of water, and then a island. And right there is one of the places where boats could come in. And so it was also a place where they protected against intruders. Here's just some more information. I read some of that to you. And... Have a good day. Everyone gets counted. The 2020 Census. Go to my2020census.gov. Get counted. The Census counts the population and then decides, based on that population, how much money communities receive for important services like schools, hospitals, roads, fire departments, and police departments. Go to my2020census.gov. Counting the number of people in the census determines how much federal money is allocated for schools. After this pandemic, people realize how important schools are now more than ever. Go to my2020census.gov. Counting the number of people in the census determines how much federal money is allocated to roads, and we all use those. Go to my2020census.gov. Counting the number of people in the census determines how much federal money is allocated for hospitals. Since this pandemic, we are very aware of how important those are. Go to my2020census.gov. Counting the number of people in the census determines how much federal money is allocated for fire departments. We all need those. Go to my2020census.gov. Counting the number of people in the census determines how much federal money is allocated for police departments, and we all feel safer with those. Go to my2020census.gov. So how do I complete mine? 
You can complete your census in one of three ways. Go online to my2020census.gov and you can complete your form online. Or you can call 844-330-2020. Or you can mail in your completed census form to the National Processing Center at 100 Logistics Avenue, Jeffersonville, Indiana, 47144. Just do it. Be counted. Be counted. My2020census.gov. Welcome. My name is John Dutton, and today I am going to show you how to program with Python. We are going to use a couple different tools. One of those tools is called Replit. We'll be going out to their website. And we are also going to be using a tool called Turtle. So the first thing that I want you to do if you're following along, is I want you to go to Replit. And that's what you see on my screen right now. The website is repl.it. And what we're going to do is we are going to create a new REPL. And we are going to use Python. You see here that I have Python as my favorites. Uh, and specifically, if you start typing Python, you'll see a few options. We are going to use Python with Turtle. And we'll see why in just a second. It will make a random name for you. What you're going to want to do is you're going to want to put in a name and this is going to be draw a letter C is what we're going to be doing today. It could be any name that you want, but that's the name I'm going to use. In fact, I've already used it. So I'm going to say draw a letter C today. So what happens is the replit screen starts up. Here is where you are going to put your code. Over here is where we're gonna see the results of the code. So let's use an example by clicking on examples. And so this is the example. It puts the code in the coding window. And then what we can do is we can click run. And the turtle in fact moves around the screen, in this case drawing a square, where each side is a different color. We'll see the details of the code in just a minute as we write our own program. So what I want you to do is I want you to get rid of all this. All right, and I'm magically going to switch my tab over to where I am going to program with you. So in this window, what I, the first line that I want you to write is this line number one. So these are the line numbers over here on the left. So line number one says from turtle import star. So this line of code is saying, take from a particular library, a library is code that has already been created by someone else. You can even make your own libraries if you want. This library is called turtle. And we are going to import, meaning we are going to take into our code star. And star in computer programming means everything. It means all of it. So we're going to take all of the turtle commands and we're going to make them available for the rest of our code. And then what you see is I have preloaded this, which you don't need to have. You just need to follow along with the code I write. But I have preloaded this code with all sorts of comments. And the reason I've done that is because comments are a great way to keep track of the code that you are writing, the code that you want to write, and they're a great way to look back afterwards, after you've written code or after someone else has, in order to figure out what the intent of the code is. Sometimes code can be really complex, and when you're looking at the code itself, it can be difficult to figure out what code is which. Um, like, what does this line do? What does that line do? So that's the purpose of the comments. So let's go ahead and start programming. So the first thing that I wanna do is I wanna change the color of the pen. So the turtle is the little thing that moves around and it has a pen. 
And what we can do in order to change its color is we can type the color command and then parentheses. You'll notice that we're going to use parentheses a lot. Those parentheses help us uh, determine a particular option for a command. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put inside of single quotes the color red. And that will actually make the pen red. Uh, right now, we want to make sure that the pen is not uh, down, meaning it's not going to draw as we move the turtle around. So we're going to lift the pen up, and we do that by typing pen up. For the next line, I want to move the turtle to the lower left-hand corner of the screen. So over here is the screen that we're going to be drawing in, and it operates on the X and Y axis. So what I want to do is I want to move the pen, the, the turtle rather, to the lower left-hand corner. So I'm going to go into negative territory on the x-axis, negative territory on the y-axis, and I'm going to give some coordinates. So I'm going to type go to, and I happen to know that I want to go about 250 paces to the left on the x-axis and 150 paces down on the y-axis. And that will get me to the lower left-hand corner. My next step is that I want to put the pen down because I want to actually start to draw now that I'm where I want to be. So I did say that we were going to draw a letter C and we're going to start drawing that letter C by drawing the vertical line first, the side of the C. Well, the turtle is currently pointing to the right. That's how the turtle always starts, okay? But I want it to turn 90 degrees to the left in order to be able to draw this C, the vertical line of the C, up, okay? So I need, to, I need it to turn 90 degrees to the left in order to turn up. So I'm going to say left, 90. Right, and that will turn the turtle 90 degrees to the left. And then in order to actually make that vertical line of the C, I need to move the turtle 400 paces forwards. So I'm going to say forward 400. And at this point, I should have the vertical line of the C. So let's run it and make sure that it works as we thought it was going to work. And look at that, it starts to make the C and it makes that vertical line and the turtle ends up at the top. So let's keep that in mind and it's pointed up. So next we wanna drop, draw the top horizontal line. As I said, the turtle is currently pointing up. It needs to turn 90 degrees to the right in order to point to the right. It's currently pointed up, we want it to point to the right. So, at this point, you may have already guessed, we want it to go right 90 degrees. And then because the horizontal line is going to be shorter than the vertical line, we're going to have this move forward, but it's only going to move forward 200 paces instead of 400. So again, let's check our work, make sure this is doing what we thought it was going to do. Look at that. Now we've got two of the three parts of the C. Now, the tricky part is that we have to now get our turtle back down here so that we can draw the last part of the C. So in order to get back to where the turtle started drawing, we have to make sure to lift the pen up first. If we don't lift the pen up first, when we move it all the way down here, it'll draw a line. We don't want that line. So we're lifting the pen up, and then we're going to draw the bottom horizontal line next. Let's keep in mind where the turtle is currently pointing. It's currently pointing to the right. And that works out for us because we want it to move to the right. So we want to make the turtle move 200 paces forwards, just like we move, made it move 200 up here. But we have to make sure to put the pen down first. Because if we don't put the pen down, then it will not draw. So let's make it move forward 200 paces. Let's run the whole thing. And clearly we didn't do something right. 
So that's the great part about testing over and over again while you're writing your code. What did I forget to do? I'll give you a second to think about it. If you said, put the go to, to the original spot where the turtle was, then you are right. So up here after line 35, when I brought the pen up, I need to actually write that go to statement. And that go to statement is going to take me to the original, the origin of the C, the original location where I started, which again was X of negative 250 and Y of negative 150. All right, so let's test it one more time. And look at that, a beautiful C, a C for Cleveland, right? Now, I'm not done yet because I wanna make this a little pretty and I wanna show you uh, something a little bit different is we're gonna draw what's called a starburst. So I want my starburst to be Campus International High School colors, as you see here, are green and blue. So I'm going to define the color of the line as green. But there's one more thing about this starburst, and that is that the turtle allows us to make a shape and then fill that shape with a color. So I'm going to go ahead and fill that starburst with blue. So I define two colors. The first one is the line. The second one is the fill. Now, under line 51, we see I'm trying to tell the turtle to start drawing an object that will be filled. The command to do that is something called begin fill. Now, in the middle of this begin fill, there is an underscore. And in case you're unfamiliar with underscores, that is next to the zero on most keyboards. You usually have to hold down the shift in order to get the underscore. And then the next part is the trickiest of the whole program. It's where I want to actually draw this a line back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth across a whole circle. And I'm going to shift that line 10 degrees every time. And because a whole circle is 360 degrees, I'm gonna draw 36 lines. 36 lines times 10 degrees equals 360 degrees for the whole circle. And how I'm going to do that, instead of just writing 36 different draw line statements, is I'm going to do a loop. So this is how we're gonna write a loop. So we're gonna start with a four, and then I'm gonna use a variable, and x always makes for a good variable. And then I'm gonna say for x in, and essentially 36 times, Here's how I'm gonna do that. There's something called range. So I'm gonna go from zero to 36. It's gonna stop before it hits 36. So it'll do it 36 times. And everything that is indented, meaning has a tab in it, after this four, you see this vertical line helps us understand where that is, is going to actually happen 36 times. So what I'm going to do is in order to draw this starburst, I'm gonna go forward 200 steps every time. And I'm also going to go left 170 degrees. Now at the beginning, I said I was gonna move 10 degrees every time. Well, if I move left 170, I'm not quite going 180 degrees, which is turning around. I'm going 10 degrees short of turning around. So that's how I'm moving 10 degrees every time is by going 10 degrees short of 180. Finally, I want to tell the turtle to stop drawing an object that will be filled. So I'm not, I'm no longer drawing that line. I'm out of that loop. And I'm going to say end underscore fill. And then I can do finish drawing. So that's finish drawing is going to be done in this case. Let's run the code, see how it looks. Here it makes the C, changes the color, starts making these lines. Line after line after line. 
And what we see here is that it is making a total of 36 lines. If you enjoyed this, please don't hesitate to visit my website for more information about coding. I will be recording part two if I get some feedback and we can learn some more. I was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm in the Fulton, Memphis area. My wife and I and our three boys live in Edgewater. I live in the Lakeshore, Collinwood Arts District. I live in Camps Corner area. I've lived in the West Park neighborhood for 21 years. For five years. I've lived in Cleveland all my life. 37 years. Majority of my life. All my life. 18 years. Cleveland's great. I mean, I love that there's always stuff to do. There's so many free things to do with kids. Best city in the country. <laughs> I love it. I mean, it's a good, good city. The school system is awesome. I think Cleveland schools are making great progress. New things are happening at CMSD, you know, I want to be a part of that. So the Cleveland Plan was legislation that was put in place in 2012 to be able to transform Cleveland's public schools. The change in the school district in the last, you know, 10 years is one that's focused on high performance, that's focused on providing school choice for families so they can figure out what school is best for them and moving into a period where we're acknowledging that education needs need to change for our students, for our economy, for our families, and how do we meet families where they are to do that. The schools offer far more choices. They're more career oriented. All kids don't learn the same. All kids aren't interested in the same things. I, I like the fact that we do have those choices. If your child needs a particular approach or needs in the kind of classroom to help meet their, their growth, uh, I think the Cleveland plan is about providing the options to it. I've just been really happy with the preschool here. It's just, I'm just so grateful that I found this school and that my child is here. It's nice. It's very nice to know um, I can choose what school. I can um, have my options of going to each building and seeing what is the best choice for my kids. When I did research, I was looking for the best schools that Cleveland had to offer. The teachers are great. They work well with us. They constantly keep in communication with us, and that's really the key is like that we're all involved. It's nice to walk into a school and have them know who you are. The structure of the academics is very, very rigorous, and I love it. I am a 2016 graduate of Cleveland Early College High School on the John Hay campus. Choice for me was great because I had the opportunity to really take ownership of my education. The high school graduation push and the increase is definitely a result of what the district is doing in order for the schools to thrive. Because now you have better schools, quality schools, and when you can push that, students see that you care about them. Now they begin to care about their education. We stand with 117 private colleges that are gonna offer every student in the public school system of Cleveland, Ohio, free college tuition. Say Yes to Education is an initiative in our city which offer wraparound support services to students and their families so that students can be most successful in their K through 12 education. Probably the biggest headline of Say Yes is that it's gonna offer last dollar tuition scholarships to students um, to any public two or four year institution as well as accredited Pell eligible career and technical trainings. Families at this point have no choice to say that, oh, my child, I can't afford college, or I'm not gonna send my child to college because that opportunity is there. The barriers, the social, economic, demographic, all of the things that especially a lot of urban kids have to endure, which prevents a lot of them from prospering, are definitely minimized. It's amazing. Um, I couldn't be happier with the way Cleveland is moving up. We are doing what we set out to do in 2012 with the Cleveland Plan. We are actually seeing results, and that's a great thing. It's an incredible accomplishment. We don't see this kind of growth in an urban district elsewhere in this country. The children are the future. Anything that we do, we have to plan for them to get a great education, a quality education that is technologically advanced so that they're prepared. And with that preparation, you can't stop us cannot stop us, so look out every other city because Cleveland is on their way. <laughs> Good morning. 
My name is Mrs. Graytech and I teach English 3 and AP Language over at John Marshall IT. Recently, I know that Ms. Thompson's talked to you guys about upstanders and the local heroes you have in your community or maybe even that you live with. But today I wanted to focus on the heroes in the books we have you guys read or the movies that you go see. So let's start with epic heroes. Because what does epic mean to you guys? You use it all the time. You didn't invent the word, but when you use it, it is exactly this. It is about people who are beyond brave, beyond smart, and beyond strong. They are so far above everybody else, they leave us all in the dust. But they're also on a quest. Like They have to have a mission to feel fulfilled. They are ethical. They will do the right thing. They will put their lives on the line for you. And they're a good leader. People want to follow them because they are all these things. And they reflect the ideals of the society they lived in. So if you had an English teacher who had you read about the Trojan War, if you read about that famous horse that they brought into the city, then you read about an epic hero because Odysseus is one of those guys. He created that horse. He created the whole idea. And because of his idea, they were able to end the war and win it. But maybe you didn't read that. And maybe some of you who are older, who have read Beowulf, that's another epic hero. It's, this is a guy who went to different countries to defeat monsters with his bare hands because he's just that good. He's strong and he's smart and he outwits them and he defeats them and he saves the day for everybody. But he's also a little full of himself. But you guys, you have modern heroes, mostly in your movies, but you do have modern heroes. And your modern epic heroes are easily recognizable. So you got Luke Skywalker. Everybody knows who he is. He defeats Darth Vader. He helps restore the balance at the end. We all know who he is. Aquaman, same thing. He's a little upset that he doesn't get to grow up with his mom. But because of it, he's strong and he's got, well, let's be honest. He's got a little bit of a grudge against the Mer people but he does end up reuniting them because he does the right thing. The Black Panther, same thing. His approach to how he rules his people is different than his father's, and he realizes they shouldn't have isolated themselves, but he still needs to protect his people. So it's a fine balance, but he does the right thing. And Captain Marvel, she didn't even know who she was. But again, once they come into their own, they do the right thing for their people to take care of the people they love and the people that they are in charge of and responsible for, because that's what good leaders do. But maybe this isn't your kind of hero. Maybe you're more into fantasy. And in which case, then we need to look at the romantic heroes. Romantic hero doesn't mean that they're full of love and they have a love line and a everything has a love interest. That's not the case. I mean, it might be part of it, but it doesn't have to be. The biggest thing about romantic heroes is that they have magic. We don't know everything about them because sometimes their backstory is a little fuzzy, but they do have some kind of initiation. They do have magic weapons. They usually have a magic mentor or at least someone who's very smart to guide them. And when they leave us, it's a little fuzzy, too, because they might be back to help us. So if you've read any of the King Arthur stories, that is a perfect example of a romantic hero. He grows up with a family as a servant. He pulls a sword out of a stone, and boom, he's king. And he has Merlin to help him. And when he leaves the world, we don't really know that he's dead. He was severely injured. He's probably dead, but we don't know that for sure. So he could just pop up sometime when we really need him. Okay, so who does that sound like that you guys have read about? How about Harry Potter? That kid was always in trouble. And I don't mean trouble because he did something wrong. I mean trouble because it, it came to his front door. And he always tried to do the right thing for people, even when it was people he didn't like, like Draco Malfoy. Wonder Woman, same thing. 
she comes in and out of our world depending on when we need her. Sometimes there are decades of a gap between when we see her. But the one you might be wondering about there is Indiana Jones. And I know some of you are thinking, he's human. He's an archaeologist. What's so magical about him? But you can make a case for him because you think about it, the artifacts that he goes after are all magical. And it's the same thing. He's trying to do the right thing. The Holy Grail, he could take it. He could cause trouble, but he said, no, that we were told to leave it here. We should leave it here. As a result, the person he was with tried to take it. She falls down a hole to her death. These guys, again, try to protect people and try to defeat evil. They just have a lot of fight ahead of them. Now, are there other kinds of heroes? Absolutely. There's something we call a tragic hero. Tragic hero means that they have come from some kind of noble birth. So they're kings, they're queens, they're royalty, they're some, they've got money somewhere. But they've also got a huge problem. They've got one big flaw, and it's usually their pride that gets in the way. And this flaw causes them to have a problem at the end. Sometimes that problem, well, let's be honest, most of the time, that problem is bigger than they deserve. So if you read Hamlet, Hamlet's uncle kills Hamlet's father, marries Hamlet's mom. Hamlet finds out. He tries to get revenge and tries to kill his uncle. And he has this whole plan that he doesn't tell anybody about because he's going to do it himself. And in the end, his pride gets the better of him. If you read Antigone, same thing. Antigone is ruled by her uncle Creon, who's the king. And Creon was at war. It was a civil war. Somehow Antigone's brothers ended up on opposite sides of the war. When Creon's army won, he gave all his men who died warrior funerals. But the losers, his nephew, they were, re they were told they had to leave them on the battlefield and just let the bodies rot. Mm -hmm. But Antigone says, no, I can't do that. That's my brother. And she tries to give him a funeral. Well, then she gets in trouble with her uncle. And long story short, he tries to kill her. He blocks her up in a cave, puts a big rock in it, going to starve her out. That way, technically, he didn't kill her directly. She just ends up starving to death. And when he goes back to try and rescue her, well, she's hanged herself. So, there is a point at which they realize, wow, I'm in a lot of trouble and it is my fault, but I have to keep going. And maybe you haven't read Hamlet, maybe you haven't read Antigone, but I bet you've read some of these other things. In Harry Potter, Snape, perfect example. He really was a good guy, but for how many movies did we think he wasn't? And he always thought he was better than everybody else. And in the end, what was his fate? He gets killed by a bite in the neck from a gigantic snake. That doesn't seem quite fair for a guy who's trying to do the right thing. Anakin Skywalker becomes Darth Vader. But again, in the end, he dies and it causes him his death. He's finally redeemed, but at the cost of his life. And some of you might be looking at Elsa going, I don't see her as a tragic hero. And she doesn't totally fit the mold. Let's face it, she's a queen. So we know she's noble birth, but everybody turns on her and then she loses her kingdom. And in the end, she kind of gets it back. So she doesn't have a totally tragic end. She's a little different. But maybe some of these heroes, tragic or epic or romantic, still aren't your cup of tea. Maybe you just are not feeling any of these people. Then I bet that you are an anti-hero fan. And their, sh their list is so much shorter because, well, look at number one. They lack the traditional hero traits. That means they're usually not brave. They're usually not honest. And they actually, usually, have the opposite traits. Now, that doesn't mean they can't do brave things. It just usually means if they do do something brave, then it's for selfish reasons. So, for example, you see there at Leonardo DiCaprio. That is a picture from The Great Gatsby. 
I had my AP kids read it this year and they just, they just got so upset with him because they couldn't understand why he would put out all this money and go to all this trouble to win over a woman who in their estimation was a shallow, flaky social climber. And they didn't like that. But again, he was in love with the woman. He did some things that were not necessarily legal to try and get money so he could impress her. Now, I'm guessing you may not be familiar with The Great Gatsby, but I bet you are with these guys. Deadpool, Shrek, Captain Jack Sparrow, classic, not your typical hero guys, but they usually do the right things. Maybe not for the right reasons, but they will do the right things. And here's the best part. Audiences love these kinds of heroes. We get attached to these guys because maybe out of all the heroes, they're most like us. But the bottom line is somewhere in these four kinds of heroes that you read in the books, I'm betting you find some people that you live with and people that you know. But we're English teachers, right? And we always tell you that the book is better than the movie because, well, it is. That's just how we roll. But in this case, I'm going to show you the movie posters to the mo to all the books that I talked about so that you can look at them over summer break. And maybe when the libraries open back up, you can actually go get the book out. First, we have the Odyssey. And I have to admit, this one's a little bit harder to get a hold of because this is an older one. Beowulf is animated. And The Great Gatsby, well, there are three versions. Leonardo's is just the most recent one. Hamlet, again, multiple, multiple movies. Most recent, it seems to be the one that my kids most like when we watch it. Merlin, you got to be a fantasy person to like that one. And Antigone, while I love the story, unless you are a fan of black and white movies, you're just not going to be a fan of this movie. Now, the Harry Potter movies, seven books, eight movies, that's a lot of movie watching or a lot of reading. I'm going to hope you're reading. In any case, start thinking about these people when you go to the movies, when you read these books. Who are the heroes? What makes them a hero? What are their qualities? And then think about the people in your life. Can you compare them to anybody in what you read? Because ultimately, reading should reflect our lives and what we believe. And if nothing else, it's an escape.